Yes. Ha 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 ha. Look at us on a Thursday morning. Look at us. The day after Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day for yesterday. Look what I have. Is that a Valentine's card? No, what it's not that? a card. It's my notebook. Oh, it just says happy day. This uh, with the uh, <laughs> sort of like rocking horse thing. I just realized that this is the notebook I have with me today. Oh, nice. And it's it's really cute. Oh, nice. That's very pretty. Really cute. It's really, really cute. Uh, I, uh, day after Valentine's kind of happy day cheer. Yeah, I have... Um... I've started writing notes because I'm, I'm in so many meetings now. We've got a whole lot of stuff <laughs> happening here again. So suddenly I have to write down notes. And I haven't done that for a while, for about the last, well, since COVID, really. I, did, I just stopped. I had. You're such a good note taker. I know. Though. And I had uh, almost like one of those books for every year. And they're all in the shelf there. And I looked through some of them the other day. I'm like, Geez, I took a lot of notes. And some of those meetings. You look back, and I guarantee if anybody else does this exercise, if you keep notes or whatever, you look back over, I don't know, two years of notes uh, for meetings and things. 60% of those meetings, total waste of time. Mm. Right? She sips her coffee, knowing that I'm correct. I'm right. No, I'm just going to say, meetings... And meetings and meetings and meetings. Such a waste of time. Can be a oh. complete waste of time. But a lot of times, it's it's the ideas you get in the meeting. Ah, uh, bullshit. That I'm telling you. Ah, uh, bullshit. Gareth, it's like when people tell me, we're going to have a brainstorm about something. I'm no, like, no, nah, no, I no, don't no, want to no, hear that. Not brainstorming. <laughs> but some of these meetings, the stuff that you talk about. I was in a meeting yesterday afternoon. Yes. Which... I got pulled you have, into. You have amazing meetings and you're on all the WhatsApp groups. I'm not on all the You're WhatsApp on all groups. of them. I know people who there's you a, don't even know I know that say, you're that for me. Listen, there's, 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 a, there's a new WhatsApp group, which is an MK WhatsApp group, which was mobilizing to get people to come to the Alexander event. You know, there was that event where Mshulozi was in Alexander. I'm, I'm, I, I had, am not on that WhatsApp group. I had people who I know who were there. I. I mm -hmm. am not on that WhatsApp group. <laughs> I would love to be a bloody fly on the wall in that WhatsApp group. Uh, I, I, I'm, I like being in the WhatsApp groups. I'm very quiet. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not I'm a dusting off. rabble rousing. No, you're not a rabble rouser, but you are very connected and people are in, you're included in groups that most of us are not. Yes. Yeah, but it's, Own it. it's but it's my people. It's very you know? influential. It's my people. She's very powerful and influential. This pulling much <laughs> hugely. Um, I've got to dust off all my arcane Jacob Zuma stuff again and start bringing it out because you know we were very involved in his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> Say we. <laughs> no, seriously. It, it, we like the way that Tutu Zane uses we. You mean the disrespectful young man. He's a disrespectful young man who does not uh, appreciate his elders. We, oui, he says. I, I watched that little uh, What's thing. his party called? Uh, do, do, All, game oh. All game changes. All game changes. All game changes. It sounds are in like that a, party. It sounds like a low budget show on Netflix for like people who redo houses. All <laughs> game changes. Yeah. We, don't worry, on this episode of All Game Changers, we've just bought this house and we're going to renovate it and we've got a budget of $50,000 and we want to change the bathrooms and the kitchens on All Game Changers this week. The, all that's Game Changers. Like. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sound like that to you? But then we mustn't say anything horrible about that because today on the I, Burning Platform, we've got someone whose party is called Change Starts Now. Yes, sir. Which is the party probably people are talking the least about in South Africa, but I've been told by very important business people we've got to pay attention to this party. So, well, I did send I did send um Dory and That's Roger WhatsApp. Jardine, by the way. I did send Dory a WhatsApp to ask if if we can get to Duzani here. So let's not don't say mm. too many horrible things. He'll never come. He'll come. I've uh, I still get uh, messages from him every now and then. When he wants something, and then I ignore them. <laughs> hey, you and that. Powerful people want yeah. things from you. Oh, yeah. Hey. Mm. I got numbers on my phone. But I'm, ex I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited for I'm excited for today's conversation. Oh, but God. I do have... So today, I have 
news again. Yes. About yet another by-election in KZN. Ah, a ching a ching. Put me uh, with the latest. Uh, Ed, this morning when I woke up the, the, and looked at the results, they were still counting. Can I? Can I guess? Can I guess? Yeah. Okay. With my limited understanding of KZN's local politics, I would say we got like a surprise because that's what they're gonna they're gonna watch the news outlets start saying. This was a surprise result. I'm guessing between twenty and twenty five percent MK. Thirty three. Jesus, more than I would have even thought. They'll go surprise. They'll go, surprise, IFP surprise. retains the ward. IFP yeah. retains the ward. Mm-hmm. Um, is uh, ANC down, mm. but came in second? MK. MK, big Third. showing. Big showing. Big showing. And no showing from the EFF. They lost 11 points. Yes, yes that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, you see, do you who think, else? NFP do you think wasn't that, on the ballot. Do you think that that's people who wouldn't have voted coming out for MK? Or do you think it's ANC and EFF voters going to MK? Or do you think it's uh, a whole new constituency we haven't paid attention I, to? I think that looking at it's how the numbers are, looking at where the losses are, ANC lost ground, EFF lost ground, uh, IFP did not. Mm. Uh, who was not on the ballot? Uh, FF was not on that ballot. But yeah, I don't surprisingly, somehow, I, you know who else was on the ballot <laughs> is uh, Sarah was on the ballot hmm. and they didn't do very oh, we've well. Oh, got, we've got, uh, we got <clears throat> Sarah on next Colleen's week. coming. Yeah, Colleen Makubele. Colleen's coming. But listen, guys, MK, they, they, are, they, they really are. NFP lost to MK. Oh, so yeah. NFP lost mm-hmm. to MK. What EFF was that leader of NFP called? Zanele Magwazam Sibi. Shame. She's gone here. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Magwazam <laughs> Sibi. So interesting. These are these are interesting. In, but well, don't forget, I said this last week. I'm going to say it again. Don't forget that what what these ward elections, these by elections, are also about people, right? These are people that they know in the community. So that's why they will vote for them. It's not. I saw like a. I saw Selga are saying, "Please, can we stop killing people in uh, KZN who are running for political office?" And I'm like, "Nah, don't stop." Hi, Gareth. Can't stop. Don't stop. Hi, Gareth. How does it go? Can't stop. Don't stop. No, right? no, 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 no. no. I, 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 the I, more, I, the merrier. I, I, we need less politicians. Uh, I see this Gareth, as a sustainable Gareth, activity. It, it, this is a slippery, slippery slope. This is a problem South Africa had in a. Big way leading up to the 94 elections. I'm being glib. And all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, oh, listen, there were two independents who also came in with votes. And in this ahead pilot. Of, in this really? pilot, ahead of the EFF. Okay. And this is the EFF that had, How did you see the pictures? Yeah, did they, you see the pictures from the, uh, From Moses Mabida. Yeah. So, oh, Julius was saying, well, of course I saw the pictures where he had snot all over himself in the microphone. I, um it's not a good result. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to talk about the EFF for a second because I saw. <laughs> All right. So I saw Bafana came back to the airport yesterday. Mm. No, I mean, look, you know, there weren't hundreds of people. There weren't even thousands of people. There definitely there, weren't no, thousands. There, there, there were a few there hundred a, people. There, a few there, hundred there, people. There were hundreds. Did you notice how many of them were EFF people? I wondered if. If the EFF organized buses. No, so here's what I think happened. So, Is this a conspiracy theory? No, so I saw the EFF flag. I saw a lot of people in red shirts. And it's hard to tell whether that's, you know, because Kasatu used to be the red. Remember? Yo. And the SACP, Yo. they used to be. But now you can pretty much guarantee it's the EFF. And it suddenly dawned on me. I'm like, so they didn't, <laughs> they didn't win. Did you? Here's what happened. What did the EFF and... Bafana Bafana have in common, right? They came in third. They both came in third. <laughs> so they, it's people who come third. In other words, second, to each other. second place losers getting together. That's what that was. And I know a lot of people are very excited about Bafana because they did better than we expected. In fact, even the coach said, we can't believe what are these Dutch or something. Yes. Thank you. Bruce. Oh, Bruce. He, well, how did other Dutch talk again? I'm trying to think Bruce. here. Yeah, ik begrip geen bal van. Hey. <laughs> I don't understand, but suddenly we do very well. Everybody's very surprised. <laughs> so I'm the like, best they have done in 24 years. Three, three places. 
So but not first, not the winners, not the second runner-ups, but third place. That's the EFF sweet spot. So that's why they went. They understand their place in the hierarchy. <laughs> not first, not second, third. But as you tell me in this by-election, not even fourth. Yeah. Hashem. No, they weren't even <laughs> fourth. And it's it, it's just uh, more now. More uh, for now. all those people who came here this morning just for our EFF jokes, that you can you can tune out now. Uh, Bronwyn, maybe the red shirts were for Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, maybe, hey? Maybe it was Valentine's Day. Well done, Bronwyn. Good point. Well put. Lots of comments about how great you look this morning for me, and you do. Um, please do a blind history on dynasties and empires. Well, I got a, a very rude email from someone uh, about blind history saying that they are not going to wait any longer. So I'm like, well, I'm, I've been talking to Anthony about it. We've been trying to make plans. Don't worry. It's not his fault. It's not my fault. We've got things on the go. You're just going to have to wait. Good things come to those who wait. Weren't you taught well, that by your parents? Well, I mean, yeah. we, that's what we're waiting for in South Africa with these elections. Good <laughs> things will come. Just wait. So Mapello also brings up yesterday, uh, we played out the interview with a friendly Satanist. What? Uh, yeah. How did, uh, yesterday, though, I was trying to catch up with all of the stuff for today. No, so. no, no. You don't have to feel bad. Pumi does all the reading. <laughs> I, I don't bother with that. She's been reading manifestos <laughs> until she's blue in the face. Um, you know, we had a guy on called Tristan. He's a uh, friendly Satanist. And wow. I, I found the whole interview very frustrating because... He must decide if he's an atheist or well, a Satanist. Well, that's what Mapello says. But I just don't think it's a religion. I really, I just can't take it seriously as a religion. And you know, a lot of people immediately when they see Satanists, they go, oh my God, they're sacrificing cats. They're going to bring demons into my world. They're going to make it difficult for me to like uh, have uh, good things happen to me. It's like uh, Gogo Maweni or Gogo Skwateni. You know, it's not that, <laughs> right? That's this, this guy. I promise you now. Uh, if he is a representative of the, the Satan, then you have what nothing. What does that mean? He's a representative. <laughs> you have nothing to fear. Don't laugh. You have Gary. nothing. No, like, guys. This, is a, this is a genuine if anyone question. Was, I want to know. If anyone was worried to listen to the interview because they're worried about Satan taking over their soul. I mean, if this guy is Satan's emissary on earth. You don't have to worry about Satan for the next 2,000 years. You, you know that you're, okay, you're in the Lucifer. clear. Yeah. Now, that's what I was hoping for. I was hoping for someone to talk A to Lucifer-esque No, I was, I was hoping for someone to come in here and like blow me away with stories of how, you know, God's favorite angel was cast out of heaven. And there's this story about how he started his own empire in hell. And there's this ongoing battle in eternity for the souls of mortal men. I would have gone, tell me more. I've been mean, like, this is this is a good story. I, at the very least. There was none of that. He's like, no, I believe, I believe in individual sovereignty, and uh, there's a whole lot of like, we got to stand up for the LGBT. I don't know how that comes into it. It's like then he brings up postmodernism with Foucault, and I'm I'm like, no, you just sound like a university graduate or a university permanent university student. I mean that with all the disrespect that it entails. Who just is desperate to fit in somewhere. And I, I really got that impression. I got the but, impression this guy's just like a, he's just like one of those people that I used to know. You could see them from a mile away on, on campus. They were just like always either on their own or with the other bunch of misfits, just trying desperately to fit in. You know, please love me. Please let me into your, because you guys look like you're having so much fun and I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be, just look cool and be interesting. And I mean no disrespect here because Tristan was a he, I think he came in here with good intentions. It's just it's facile. It's not even it's not a serious thing. There are probably is he, al is he alone or is he part of a group of no. people? Is he the spokesperson of a no. group of people? The these Satanists, and this is where Marpello's right about the overlap between atheism and Satanism in, in the case of this guy, is like he he has nothing in common with any others. It's not like they have a church, they get together on, on Sundays or they follow some holy writ that they all agree on. There's nothing. There's no, there's no central value system or co collection of tenets or dogma or 
guiding philosophy, nothing. It's all totally made up from his point. I mean, these are his, you can listen to it to yourself and for yourself and find out. I, I've, I, I tried. I, I asked questions about what it might be that brings these people together, why you'd want to be a Satanist. No good reason. By, by a guy who calls himself the friendly Satanist on social friendly media. Satanist. And I mean, also, really, if you're, gonna, if you're going to be a friendly Satanist, you, you're kind of missing the point. Because like people who want to be Satanists want the angry Satanist. They want the mean Satanist. They want the <laughs> evil. You should call yourself the evil Satanist. You'll draw more. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to know your target so, market. Kind of when I love that Lucifer show. <laughs> right? Okay. And one you of could the be the, reasons, uh, the, the, the TV segments. <laughs> one of the reasons I love it so much. I mean, he yeah. loves it because Lucifer is ultra cool. Yeah, he's cool. And, and right. you know, and he's, and he's glib and he's just, but I love it because it's so, it's such a spin on who this angry guy is supposed to be, right? It's, no. Because Lucifer is, he's, this wonderful, sweet, sensitive yeah, charming, guy. Charming, charming. He's got, of course, he's charming. He's got he's all Satan. the, he's got all the qualities of an angel, but he's also deeply <laughs> self-absorbed and narcissistic. Absolutely, and, and right. that's that's I, I, that's what I would have. I'm not saying I know anything about the personality of the devil or anything. <laughs> 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 Sorry, what was that? Did you hear that? Uh, somebody su suggested here in the comments that maybe you should listen to the show backwards and it'll all... <laughs> <laughs> do, you you see... remember, do you uh, remember when there was all uh, that? Uh, You've got to listen to it backwards to get the message. Yeah, yeah. And every every band that anyone thought was cool was also... There was a group of like nerds at school or at varsity who told you, and they're all Satanists. And what... Like ACDC, my favorite hard rock <laughs> band. They told me after Christ, devil comes. That's what that stands for. Not alternating current, direct current, with the little lightning bolt in between, by the way, as if there could be any more direct, your pardon the pun, uh, acknowledgement of where the name comes from. ACDC, no, no, no. I had, there was this one dude at school with us. He was like one of these reborn, charismatic Christian types who was big into it. He was like a zealous, over the top, like would stand up in class and like disagree with teachers because of scripture or whatever. Believe it or not, there used to be people like that. At least I admire I the I admire the fact that he used to do that. But I mean, he was just a he was just too uh, consumed by the passion. <laughs> Who knows, right? Over not consumed and, by the passion, uh, overcome, overcome by the, by Holy, the Spirit. Holy Spirit. This it's guy drove this guy drove me up the wall, and I mean, I used to try because i think at school you have time on your hands and you're also trying to figure out whether you're smart or dumb and whether other people are smart or dumb or whether you can learn from them or whether you need to teach them because everybody you know especially yeah. school kids that's what you're trying to do and for guys we we only bond with other guys if we're learning mm. that's okay. that's kind of a a, a, a truism across oh, wow. the genders is that women commune and women share and women talk and women communicate and that's no use to men at all. No use. Unless we're learning something, we're not bonding. Or unless you're being foolish in a group. Uh, yeah, being foolish is, uh, that's a very good way of bonding. But it's being, <laughs> being foolish, being in foolish a group or learning. Always but men, men don't, we, don't, we don't sit and foolish. talk about each other's uh, relationships or feeling. God forbid, if you find yourself in a group of men who's talking like that, just Get out as quickly as you can because it's just going to lead to hell in a handbasket if you'll pardon the pun on the poor Satanists. <laughs> but anyway, I, I remember this guy and he would, he would tell me how everything, he was consumed by the fact that everywhere around us there were demons and devils and desert jinns and things that were trying to kill you, things that were trying to take your soul. I mean, if you were a more gullible, credulous kind of person, and you found yourself in his company, he wouldn't waste any time convincing you that all of nature was against you. Something was coming to get you. Now, I was hoping that this friendly Satanist was going to be like one of those people. Because then you could, you could find out about all the evil that lurks, like in a rock band's name or in their songs if you played it backwards. Or 
you know, while you were sleeping, you know, your, your little sister would start levitating in the bed and her head would go around 360 degrees. But that shit never happens. You know, there's, I'm so upset there's for a, there's the a, Satanists because they don't have any cool tricks. There's a you know, at least the Christians I follow. At least the Christians still have those churches where people drink you know, poison and, you know, those ones. Uh-huh. Yeah, and they eat like handfuls of grass and they still go to the trouble of doing a little miracle in inverted commas every now and then. Satanists aren't even trying that by the sound of this guy. It's, just, it's like a philosophy graduate who's uh-huh. disagreeing with other philosophy graduates. Uh-huh. So there's this account I follow hmm. called Morbid Not Knowledge on, on X. And yesterday, finally... Morbid enough, Knowledge. I know. I know and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I think it's, I'll follow it's, them. It's, <laughs> sounds good. It's, it's terrible. They have all of these... Um, information about all sorts of bizarre happenings all over the world mostly in the u.s but bizarre happenings and the people and the and then they they'll always have the link to the article if you know where it was covered and yesterday funny enough there was a story so two things i saw yesterday one about with like these crazy images of a guy who let me see can you see this can you see this what the hell's going on there? This, <laughs> that's a that's a body. This is MRI images of a guy. Why wow, he's got a really small penis. <laughs> <laughs> but all those little white things. You Sorry, see. Yeah, all those people who came here to the show this morning to hear smart, sensible political discourse. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Jardine's just turned his car around on Ravonia Road, decided he's not gonna thing. he's not gonna come because of what we're talking about this morning. He's like, I don't want to spend time with these morons. This, so this oh. this guy has uh why parasites. Is he, why is he MRI scanning himself? The, because he was he wasn't feeling well and then You're he, telling me all of those are parasites? Parasites. Show it again. Like a super parasite infection. Sweet Lord. No, Pumi, that can't be right. Yeah, dude, there's a link to the article. 18-year-old. Mm. Fr- guess from what? Mm, got to be American. Eating raw oh, pork. Oh, I thought you meant from Yes, it's American. Country. Yes, it's American. Raw- oh, so that's, yeah, that's what measly pork will do for you. Eating raw pork for 10 years. Why? I still don't know. But the, the story I want to tell you about that they had was of yo, a yo, girl yo. who had an exorcism. Who was like apparently had de- and for years and oh, years they tried it. all I of these exorcisms, exorcisms and all of and she eventually she actually eventually died of starvation. Oh God, because they wouldn't feed her or because, because she they wouldn't, wouldn't eat. feed her because she wouldn't eat, dude. Oh, shame. And then, uh, but her story sounds very shame. much like the exorcist story. It sounds very much like that kid because she was yeah. You see, I just I agree with uh, Mo Rabbit, who says I never knew Satanism was so lame. Now I'm never joining. <laughs> see, <sighs> does he at least have? So does he at least have like all of the benefits that oh, we always heard about? Just by the way, he loved the interview. He was like messaging Dory yesterday, oh. saying, "Oh, it's it's so great." And listen, I I don't I'll invite the guy back. I didn't find it boring. And I didn't think he was stupid. I just think that Satanism sounds really boring and but stupid. But does he have the benefits? Because um, he has the other thing about what, like he can, the he, benefits of selling your soul, right? right? Is, no, is no, supposed to be like unimaginable it would, joy and earthly. No, no it would appear all, not. All it would appear earthly, he's getting none of the, like, uh, I would sell my, I tell you right now, if God, if you're listening, <clears throat> I'll say this and I can do this on my channel because I own it, so. You can't shut me down for this. If you're listening, I'm willing to sell the soul. I want unfathomable amounts of money. I want more sex. I want to look fantastically good. This is nowhere near. I'm I'm like a five out of 10 compared to where I want to be. And I want to live for at least 200 years. You can give me those things. Deal. Have my soul. I, I could care less what happens to me in the afterlife. Have it. Take it now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> there's the deal. It's on the mm. table. If anyone's listening, maybe there's a demon who's listening right now. <laughs> hey, bring it on. I'm ready for you. Which is what Lucifer has on the show, right? Sure. That's he's what he's like, got. He's, he's charming and everybody loves him and he's good looking and he dresses well and he's got this club and all of the earthly 
wonderfulness. Mm. He has all of that. So, he gets all so the this benefits. guy doesn't have that? No, zero benefits. Uh, certainly, it doesn't appear to me he's that happy. Maybe he hasn't cracked the inner circle. Yeah, maybe he's just like he's, he's what do they call it in, uh, he's in the back Scientology? Benches. You're only in the first 13 <laughs> he's in levels. The back benches. Yeah, yeah. Oh, damn. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I uh, I love it. <clears throat> Let's look because at this. Because that is the thing that I always wonder about. Well, here's someone who might have might have sold his soul to Vodacom, but he's getting his just desserts right now. This this is a deal I'd be willing to make uh, was, because Vodacom fought this guy in the courts, Kenneth uh, Magate, for such years. a long time, and they really they tried everything to get out of this because they realized like this could bankrupt their entire. They're business. still trying. Of course they will. So apparently. They say, <laughs> this is an amazing number. If you haven't seen it, I saw it online and I was like, nah, that's, that's too much. It's got to be a hoax. But that's what they're saying, right? So apparently he's pursuing 29 billion, that's with a B, rand in compensation from Vodacom. Despite not being directly involved with patenting or developing the service, his legal battle is focused on his perceived contribution to its inception. The ongoing dispute was seen, has seen rather various valuations proposed, costs ultimately favoring his claims. If he would receive the requested compensation, Makati would rank among the top five richest South Africans, alongside Patrice Motsepe, Johan Rupert, and such people. And Emil <laughs> is fighting him to yeah. the end. Well, they have well, to, you know that, that would bankrupt Vodacom. Well, I wanted to say to you, because in last year, last year, the year before, the, the financial records that are out, um, imagine, imagine if they this only guy... made, they, they only made a net, only made yeah. a net profit of about 18 billion rand. So this is, Vodacom. This is almost double that. Yeah, Mara. So they would, they it would, pay back the money. But it would ruin the company. So then, what would happen? Like everyone on Vodacom would have to find a new cell provider. So I wonder <laughs> they'd if, hollow it out. It would, they'd have to pay over all this money to Kenneth Makate. Listen, I, <laughs> but they did spend twenty years fighting the man. No, which I know. Is like absolute corporate bully, and yeah. they continue to Correct. be corporate bullies. So, so I don't know about the actual material evidence to back up his claim, and I've never really been that interested in the detail around this because. Again, I'm not an IP lawyer, and that's very boring and arcane stuff. But if, if we imagine that he has any kind of case at all, Vodacom should have gone to him in the beginning and said, listen, dude. Yeah, but Alan Lord Craig at the time was insisting that he was the originator yeah, yeah, of this that. idea. Yeah. But when he, when he won the case um, at the Constitutional Court, I had coffee with him. I was lucky oh. enough to have coffee with you know some billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And it, what I mean about Pumi being connected. It was such an amazing conversation because it, this was the the big victory was the constitutionality of this because as you know, all of these legal battles are really around parameters. Mm -hmm. And and the constitutionality of it is the guy was in the finance department mm -hmm. and this and he came up with this thing. Also, we know somebody whose article in the staff magazine was the key um piece of evidence right. that proved that he he had come up with this idea because he it, it you know, but, they were, he was celebrated in the staff magazine. Look at what this guy came up with. But, but, but whether or not... We I, know someone who wrote that article. We, you and I. I know, but, but <laughs> Pums, whether or not on the, on the evidence he is the actual guy who came up with the idea, it's less interesting to me mm. than this idea of corporate bullying. Because, mm. you know, these big cell networks, I've dealt with them. I've been in meetings with all the CEOs of all these uh, networks. And they, to a man, they couldn't care less to hear from anybody. These guys are such big deals. These uh, these the telco CEOs. Uh, I don't have time for the what the what are you, what nonsense have you yeah. got? I don't want to hear from anybody. And I can imagine how they were dismissive of this guy. Dude. They said you're full of shit. They didn't. Ma they, they made him this quite pathetic offer in the beginning. When I think even they realized, after the constitutional court victory, they made him a really pathetic offer, and that's why they went back to if court. They, if they'd said to him. 
in the first two, three years, if they'd said to him, listen, dude, all right, here's 400 million rand. That's more than you could possibly want in a lifetime. He would have said, cool, right? Yeah. He would have taken the 400 million. 400 million sounds like a lot of money, and it is for an individual, but for a company, it's not that big. And for them to have put this away now, look at them, they're staring down the, the barrel and of a look, 29 billion rand settlement. We're talking about the stupid fact that Vodacom. last, two, last stupid, year, stupid they only made a net profit of 18 billion. Yeah, well. But they have been making billions for yeah. the past 20 years. Yep. If they had made come to the table and said, listen, dude, we'll mm. pay you one cent for every 10 we make or whatever, they could have they could have put this thing to bed, but they chose. Greedy and bullies. They chose to bully him in the hope that they would bankrupt him and tire him out of this court case. But mm. kudos to him for for sticking it out, hey? Yeah, I, listen, I'm I'm not uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that I want Vodacom bankrupted. I really don't. I don't. I think there are lots of people in this country who rely on the cell network providers and, you know, the fact that they are customers and they've paid uh, probably outrageous fees over the years for data and for calls. And well, for, you remember when they used to charge us too long, 50 and SMS? Do right? you remember when but, they used to charge us but I don't for want phoning from a Vodacom number to an MTN number? Do you remember that? Like you, yeah, there course. were different rates for all those things. Yes. Hey, these people have taken but, us for a ride. But Cheesy is right. Imagine if they were if you were to take it in shares. And these are all of the things that they could put on the table yeah, to say, they, this is how we're going to They would, they would hate they can imagine square it up. If they're fighting with them in the courts, imagine how they'd fight with them in the boardroom. Yes. <laughs> right? Anyway, look, it's not our problem. It's Vodacom's problem. And it's uh, good luck to him. And, and so, so, good luck so, to him. So one of the things, because the corporate bullying is continuing, and one of the things that I've seen in the past couple of days is they've gone into a media kind of a media battle now with him to try and ch and change because everybody is behind this guy. Yeah, we love the little guy, right. right? I saw an article saying, oh, you know, if if Vodacom were to pay him, it would Vodacom users would be the biggest losers because we'd have to like raise every I was just like Well. Vodacom. I, I know I'm trying not to So swear, we were guys. we I know. So we were talking about this that you just mentioned now. And I do want to move on to something else that I think is also going to keep uh, our attention very focused this morning. Um we went on Tuesday in Democracy 101 quite deep into how the political parties the oh. No, but how they how they have these networks of influencers and or bots that they pay money to to generate trends on Instagram, Twitter. And wherever else to make it seem like there's a groundswell of support for them. It's like when they bust people into a stadium. It's the same thing. And parties are doing this so that they can seem more influ influential and interesting and powerful than they actually are. Um, and then that went. Also, to, they can bully people yes, out bully of people. not. Right. Look how powerful we are. We're going to get what we want. And, and it also led on to the discussion around PR and how people pay <clears throat> some spin agency, some. PR consultancy to help them make their image seem more attractive and interesting in the public sphere. Because, of course, political parties, I mean, there's never been a time where people are less enthusiastic about the, the level of our political leadership. Mm. There's no one, no one's out there going, oh my God, I absolutely love Herman Mashaba. I absolutely love Cyril Ramaphosa. I absolutely love John Stiernes. And I absolutely love Julius Malema. There's very little of that kind of fervor. Right? Except in the MK. Well, in MK for J Jay Z. Yeah, and that's why it'll do well. But these PR companies and these agencies and these people who pretend that they're useful to the political parties, and all they're really doing is taking money and then generating old school PR campaigns that no one pays attention to anymore. We were talking about that on Tuesday's show mm -hmm. and saying that is such a dumb strategy in 2024. And and even the influencer thing where you're paying people because apparently now the ANC had a whole lot of people on their payroll that they were paying. Now suddenly they're not paying them anymore. Now what's going to happen? Those people are going to turn on them. Right now they're bitter and mm -hmm. resentful because they were getting money. Now they're not getting money. So you bite the hand that used to feed you. It's going to redound terribly to their detriment. Mm -hmm. And this is what these parties don't realize. It's like, first of all, it is hard to fund a political party, to go out there and seek 
funding for a political party is one of the most difficult businesses that you could possibly get into. It's hard to convince people to spend money on commercial things yeah. that are going to advantage them in the market, but even harder to go out there and convince them that they've got to back a political message or a candidate. And then they take these millions that they've, these hard earned millions that they've managed to fleece off of donors and super PACs and God knows what else. And they give it to the most useless people to help spread their message. And they wonder why it's not working. Dude. Gareth, you, and the same goes for Vodacom. You know, you know here this is my wheelhouse. Hire. Yeah, this, this is, your is wheelhouse. my wheelhouse. I'm going to have to fight you on this one. Go on. I don't think that the ad agencies or the strategists are as useless it, because all of those organizations like legal um, advisors and lawyers. Because mm. uh, guess how much the lawyers are going to take out of uh, <laughs> Kenneth Makate's uh, settlement when it eventually comes. The lawyers will probably take three quarters of that. The poor guy's going to end up poor again. <laughs> Fucking lawyers. But, I'll you tell know, you what, those lawyers, they are. When those people, those vultures come and uh, alight on your tree, you're, you're finished. But they are creatures of instruction. <laughs> Right, they can advise. Creatures. They can. Be, uh, creatures no, no. is right. The Satanist creatures. That, that's what. The, if the Satanist had told me he knows lots of lawyers, I would have taken him seriously. <laughs> they, they, they can. They can advise. They can create um, strategies. They can create communication. But at the end of the day, they can only do what their client allows them to do. And so, what you eventually see has had 20, 50, 100 different people all putting in their two cents worth and then it becomes what it becomes. Listen, advertising works. Communication works. Have you seen the kind you saw Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah, well. Right? No. Super Bowl Sunday is a big thing. I only saw, but, I only saw Robert Kennedy's ad. <laughs> which was saw. nice. It was very cool. It was nice. Apparently, it was his super pack <clears throat> so that what, paid for that. Well, I mean, he's running as an independent, which I know that you're a fan of. But what was cool about it is Robert Kennedy, obviously the nephew of John F. Kennedy, who was president in 1960. And this was from a 1960 presidential campaign. They took the exact ad that Kennedy, it's like got a jingle, Kennedy, 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 he's the man for us. You know, kind of like. <laughs> I love it. That's the proper. Someone, I, this is the line I love the most out of that <laughs> commercial. Someone who's old enough to know and young enough to do. <laughs> right. What a great line. <laughs> because, line. especially when you're running against Biden and Trump. Yeah. Right. Old enough to know. And young, young enough, enough to, to do. do. <laughs> anyway, so that's but, but so he, took, he took his uncle's campaign ad just to explain so that people don't have to go and look for it now. It's only 30 people seconds. should go look for it anyway. Uh, they It'll use the be same, fun. Look same at music, it. uh, same visuals, everything, but they've superimposed Robert Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on JFK's face. And I mean, you know, it does the job, plus, it reminds America of a time when they weren't voting for 80 year olds. Mm. And when they actually had something hopeful and optimistic to look forward to, it wasn't the decline and fall of the American empire. Absolutely. So clever ad. Very the clever only ad. ad I liked in the whole thing. Go so, on. You know, the ads on the Super Bowl were 8 million, seven, eight million a piece for the flight. Ticket. Just a flight. Not for the production. So well, you're reaching 200 million people or something. One of the biggest view viewerships in American history, mm. apparently more than uh, the moon landing. They've been the most expensive ads for 20, 30 years. So Kanye West's ad for Yeezy.com <laughs> is Kanye in his car talking about how, guys, I've spent $7 million to fly this ad, and so we didn't have enough budget to make an ad. But I'll tell you what the idea is, and then I was going to put at the bottom of the screen, I was going to, then Yeezy.com comes up. Da, 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 da. So they did not have a production budget. This was the ad that they put out. They spent $7 million for the flighting. They generated over 19 million US dollars in 24 hours from sales from that ad. Clever. Advertising works. Advertising does work. And that is a great, I would have said that's a good creative idea for an ad. <laughs> like tell people the truth. Because you, you got so much advertising that is spin and so many PR companies 
that are trying to spin for political uh, interests, for, 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 for politicians. People are sick of being bullshitted. This is also why, by the way, I don't think Vladimir Putin is an honest broker in the world. But, <laughs> but he does tell you why he's invaded Ukraine. You just have to listen to 35 minutes of Russian history to get there. <laughs> But he's not. I have not. He's so not, don't, don't. You don't have to. No, but I'll, tell you, I'll tell you. I'll give you the pricey. 900 AD to now, Ukraine part of Russia. I invade. Mm. That's pretty much what he said. But he gives. Empires and dynasties. He, he gives a detailed breakdown of why he's made the decision to do the things he's doing. Why he's, you know, prosecuting this war. And why he feels that it's necessary and moral. He gives a, he explains himself which is something politicians do not do anymore. They spin, they lie, they advertise, and they manipulate. And you could say that Russia is the worst at this, and I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I don't think Putin, again, is an honest broker. But in this case, he is telling you why. How often do you get a why? And, yeah, well. and which of our politicians in this country or in the United States, as I said on Tuesday with Jack Mutlanti, which of our politicians or anywhere else in the world, serious people who are supposedly running for leadership positions, which of those people would you trust to give you a 35-minute, without note, <laughs> lecture on the, on the history of your country? Is there one person in our parliament? Is there one? Is there one leader in any political party in South Africa who would give you 35 minutes of our history and explain how we got to where we are? Because I don't think they could. And I certainly don't think in America there's anyone who could about American history. And therefore, we are stuck with unserious people in leadership positions. And whether you like him or not, and I don't like him. You've got to always say this because dumb people will go, oh, he's very pro-Putin. I don't like him. I think he is a, a megalomaniacal, uh, narcissistic, dangerous son of a bitch who's got no respect for human rights, locks away his political opponents or kills them or worse. I mean, we've seen him do it. So are Downing you planes use... with his uh, worst uh, enemies on them. He, he, there are people languishing in Russian prisons right now oh. who've done nothing but stand against Vladimir Putin. I'm not a fan of this guy, but God damn it. He's a serious person. You can't take that away from him. He is a serious now, dangerous person. You compare person. that, just compare that to people like <laughs> any of our politicians in this country. Any one of them. So, on that blind history about empires, are you going to use some of this interview as <laughs> research for the? <laughs> no, God, no. L let me tell you, I <laughs> found I found it fascinating. There are lots of things in in the interview. I might have said this on Tuesday because I did listen to it, and I actually paid attention because I'm interested in history. I'm the only person who would have. I don't expect this to be. And he said to Tucker Carlson, who kept trying to interrupt him to get him back on track. Because, you know, these journalists always try to make the interview go the way they want it to go instead of actually asking people to tell them why, which is also what uh, made this different. We don't have the Ted couples. Despite Deep. all of Tucker's interruptions, Vladimir Putin said, and he said it before he was even interrupted. He said, listen, are we here to make a show? Da -da 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 -da, or are we here to discuss like adults? And because people's attention and span… Tucker said… Tucker said, no, we're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're here to do no, We're going to do an interview. Anyway, it was an interview. And you have to listen to people when you interview them. And he had a story to tell. You can't ask me an important question. Of why did you invade the Ukraine? And expect me to give you a sound bite. Well, I woke up yesterday morning and my coffee was strong. And I thought, yeah, let's do it. He, he was bound to give a long, complicated, not necessarily extraordinarily stimulating or entertaining answer. But of course, we live in a media age where everything is it's about- It's got to be a sound bite. Right. And it's short form content and attention span. How else are you going to put it on TikTok right. and make and, it go and, viral? And this is for dumb people. And, and, and he's not interested in reaching dumb people. And if dumb people think that the world's leaders, if they really are leaders- are going to sit there and give them entertainment, you deserve to be disappointed. In fact, that is what they do. That is exactly what they That's do. That's why they're unserious they, people. They give us entertainment 
to keep us, it's like smoke and mirrors. It's like magic. Give us entertainment to keep us right. looking over here while they're busy Bombing over here. And, just, and, fl and, and fleecing us and taxing us and taking our tax money and laundering it and putting it back in their own pockets and all of that stuff. It's not a conspiracy theory. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. And it works like this in every nation in the world. Here endeth my lesson. The <laughs> leaders of the free world, in inverted commas, are no longer the serious people on the world stage. You could say what you want about President Xi in China. You could say what you want about Vladimir Putin in Russia. And you could say what you want about Modi in India. But these are the serious people. Listen, Modi, these are Modi the, has done a thing Sure. in India. Sure. He has done so, a thing. Again, uh, because people are so stupid that they try to make everything binary. The same people who respond to TikTok videos with the little car going over the bridge because you can't just watch an interview. I don't think those people listen to this show, thank God. It's one of the reasons I enjoy doing this show. And I don't do radio and TV anymore because it's appealing to those dummies. I have to say this, though, to qualify. I am not a fan of the Putins and the Xi's. I've said that. You, you just have to listen to five minutes of the show on any given day and you'll figure it out. But these are the adults in the room. For whatever reason, the people who should be leading the charge in terms of being serious and adult have abdicated their responsibility, their gravitas, and their authority. And they've given it up to be stars. I wonder though. Justin Trudeau, Boris Johnson. I wonder though, if, if a big Joe part Biden, of it. Joe Biden, Donald Trump. These are not serious I people. Know, I wonder though, if a big part of it is not because we have become unserious. Yes, we the but a, but a real masses but a real leader doesn't so a real leader doesn't respond to popularity polls and research and do what the people want. That's a real leader, a real leader makes makes unpopular decisions sometimes. Doesn't give in to the base desires of the baying mob in the circus. That's what you don't do. The the serious emperor in ancient Rome was not the one attending the games and entertaining them. Sure, they paid for the bread and circuses. But that was to keep the dummies who are watching TikTok videos now. There's no difference between them and the circus crowds in ancient Rome. Pay for them to have that while you get on with the serious business of building public amenities, aqueducts, roads, governing the empire, running the military, making sure that you can enforce rules putting laws in place that will govern things better, making sure that real people with real objectives are put in charge of stuff. No, no, let's go to the circus and party with the people. That's what our leaders are now. They're like, yeah, party, Super Bowl ads. Dummies, they're not serious people. I promise you I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Why is Conca closing down? I, I don't know. So I, I've I, I don't know why Conca is closing down. So Conca and Soweto, for those who don't, I mean, you'd have to be living under a rock to not know about Conca, but it's the most famous night spot in South Africa for the last 10 years. No, Longer. not 10 years. Longer. Less. Uh, what, five Less. years? Five years? Conca. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Conca is, Conca's new. The, the place I've, where they are at. I've been there new. once. I've been there once. I don't know. But I do know it's been around. But Conca, the brand. Okay, so they've, they have made so much money because people go there and they spend, spend, spend. It was one of the places in South Africa you had to go. If you were anybody, you had money to spend. You could bottle service at your tables, sparklers, girls in bikinis, all kinds of outfits, weird things going on there until early hours of the morning, fancy cars parked outside. All the fancy cars Big money. Outside. Big, big conspicuous consumption money going on at Conquer. Mm. And now they tell us, hmm, after they've been shutting for temporary renovations all the last year, they're like, we're going to have our final party in May. Then we're out. How? No, so, no, 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 no. How does this happen? It says, it, the, the, the statement said that they're shutting down the Soweto 
Mm. Uh, no, no, they said, oh, yeah, no, they, they said, they, we'll, open, we'll, we'll be back. They open up in Durban, Abu Dhabi, Makufe. No, the, but the bread and lifestyle sure, events sure, sure, are sure. going to continue. Of course they will. And we'll be at the Durban July. Mm. We'll be at the F1 weekend in Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. We'll be, but we're not going to be where we have always been in the way that we have always been. And I was just like, hmm, interesting. What are they up to? It looks like they're up to something, but I've always thought of that joint as a bit of a money laundering. Well, whether it's a money laundering thing or not, the fact is that whoever the people are who've been running it, they've obviously not run it terribly well. Because if you have a golden goose and it keeps laying golden eggs like that business did, you keep it going at all costs. That's that's why I don't There's think an the enormous, business made the kind of money that well, maybe I think they just the, the I, show on social I think media they fleeced, I mean was you would have to so in other words it's just run badly because there was market demand, there was supply, all the stars aligned. All you have to do is just not show run it up. in just not run it into the ground. That's all you have to do. So whether or not this is like a next stage in their evolution, which I, I believe is possible, but why would you shut down something that works so well? Mm. And I mean, there must be small business owners all over Soweto right now rubbing their hands in glee going, well, we can fill the gap. They're going to leave. And they should. But this is, so, a, this is such a, there was such an unassailable success story. If it had just been managed a bit better, there's no reason why they'd have to shut it down. None. I can't figure it out. Can you? So that place where Gonka was um, also has a car wash and all, all sorts of things. It's part of a, it's it's the back end of a, of a strip mall. Mm. That place has been a club or drinking spot or hangout place for the better part of the past 25 years, maybe. With all sorts of different well, that's, pro that's probably brands. that's probably why I thought kind I, of yeah, iterations. I thought it had been around for yeah, so yeah, long. Yeah. yeah, it's so different brands with their name on the door, hmm. and so that spot is not going away. And I think probably a new tenant or a new brand is going to take that place. But it's a really, really good place in a in a good neighborhood that can attract lots of business. So if you're out there looking to start a club. Yeah, grab it. If you're out there looking to start a club. Grab it. But and someone, your marketing must be where, he, where, where Conka used to be. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Just just take over the place, put a new name up, and you should be fine. Uh, Steve says, our mentality is to eat the goose. Well, this is what I think happened. <laughs> so the goose is laying the golden egg. No, no, but this is what happens, is that you've got a good thing. Although it's, angry duck is quite nice. <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> Not so much angry goose, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> so your duck is laying the golden egg, goose in this case, over and over again. All you have to do is go and collect the eggs, feed the duck, mm -hmm. make sure it doesn't die. In other words, put some of the money back into the business to keep it running. Pay your suppliers, pay your staff. Just make sure everything works because there's a whole economy there. Mm. Now you're the minister of finance for that economy. You just have to keep the goose laying the golden eggs. <laughs> Ah, so why <laughs> throttle the goose and make goose liver pate? What's wrong with you? Ooh, goose liver pate. No, bad idea when you've got golden <laughs> eggs. Wouldn't you rather have 100 golden <laughs> eggs than one serving of goose liver pate? Even just the general chicken Foie egg. Foie <laughs> Really? Even just the general chicken egg. Dummies. It's Again, good. I wonder how many people wish they were sitting with that golden goose and just taking the egg and being happy with it. But there's always going to be someone who wants to kill the goose. I'm not saying that's hap but what happened, but I think it's what happened. I'm not saying it didn't. It was a very ominous statement that they put out, though. It was exactly. a, it, That statement was a little bit like, oh, exactly. hmm. It's dodgy. There's something dodgy there. What's happening there? All right, well, in uh, two or three minutes from now, we're going to find out what Roger Jardine is up to because he's got a party called Change Starts Now. They have registered for the elections. They were only established in, what, late 2023? Mm. And entered the political fray in a muted way in December because really no one was paying attention over December. Not the greatest time to have a launch, but we're going to give him a chance to 
plead his case. And as we have on the burning platform with a number of other party political leaders, and we're going to have even more over the next few weeks, we're going to let uh, Roger Jardine plead his case to you. Do the talk. Damn right. And I'm excited to meet him. I've never met him. Have you? No. Uh, he's got an interesting history. This man comes from an interesting family. He's been in a number of really, really important positions at the CSIR, the Atomic Energy Corporation. Uh, he was Director General of the Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology in Mandela's government. He's also been the CEO of Cajiso and Prime Media. We'll find out what that was like. And uh, now he's running for president. So there's two minutes before we have to to get ready for our guest. And when I saw that profile, mm. um, there's a really interesting story about his mother, I think, grandmother, uh, part of a unionist who was part of a march. That's his mom. Is it his yeah, mom? His mom. And then she was she was <laughs> beaten up. And the first so the first time I heard that story was a very interesting story at a book launch told by Albie Sachs. Yes, because his mom was also involved. Because his dad was involved in that story. His dad was right. actually, there was a banning order and his dad was thrown into jail. And a group of unionists, mainly women, yeah, because he was a lawyer, I think, at the time, went and demonstrated against this banning order and wanting to get him out of prison right. in Johannesburg at Central, what is now Johannesburg Central Prison. And Albie Sachs tells the funniest story about this woman's march because as they were chanting, what were they chanting? We want sex. Because mm. Albie Sachs. Right. Also a sex and all these women chanting towards <laughs> he wants sex. Well, this is uh, this is part of his story. And we'll ask him a little bit about his background mm. at the beginning, because I think it's always interesting to know where people come from. And we'll find out all about what the party's uh, doing and who this party is. Change starts now. We're also going to be joined by Canthon, mm. who's in this morning. And you know how he comes in and sets fire to things, too. <laughs> As if it isn't, I don't know how I manage with you and Canton in the studio sometimes. How you manage? How poor, do I manage? Poor me. Poor me that I have to Banna. keep the two of you under control. Banna. Poor me facilitating these conversations. I'm I need a medal. Shocked and horrified <laughs> that you would say this. Yeah, All right. I'll only that. allow you to get away with it because you bring coffee. And there we go. That's the <laughs> only way I keep poor me uh, happy is just bring her a coffee. It's, it's, it's small it's small uh, compensation for all the hard work she puts in all right we'll be back in just a moment don't go anywhere coming up oh wait a minute uh, this is in january this is in january 5th to the 19th of january are you going to saudi i'm going to saudi arabia no i so, so you're going to dakar Dude, dakar I, I did i did dakar in 2018 yeah i was in south america south america version i did yeah. peru very similar in the Sea of Dunes, mm. sand, off-roading nuts. Catch us every Monday at 9 a.m. on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za.
Okay, let's get cracking. Pumi Mashiko. How are you, Pums? Hey. You managing there? Uh, yeah, I'm stuck. <laughs> What you know, you Ryan at? came in here. He gave you a piece of paper. Why I know. What's no, no, no. the piece of paper? Where's it's, mine? Uh, the Where's story mine of Roger Jardine. Oh, it's the story of. All Roger. right. So let me start off by giving a little bit of a background here, and then Roger can fill in the gaps for us because people are curious about this man and where he comes from and what he's what he's done. And he's got a very very interesting resume, if I if I do say so. Uh, an anti-apartheid activist at an early age. He got a scholarship to study in the U.S., got back to South Africa in 92, became national coordinator of science and technology policy for the ANC, uh, based in their Department of Economic Planning. Leading up to the 94 elections, he worked closely with all the scientific institutions, including the CSIR, which he later became chairperson of, um, Agricultural Research Council, the Atomic Energy Corporation, big influence on dismantling our nuclear program, which I also think is fascinating. And we could talk about that for an hour or two, um, how we decided not There's to make. There's a book. Yeah, oh, yeah. There, there are books. <laughs> There's several books about this. Um, but at age 29, you were appointed director general in the Department of Arts, Culture, Science, and Technology that was in Nelson Mandela's government. That made you the youngest director general in South Africa's history. You also then went on to hold positions in private business in Kahisa Media and Prime Media. I'm not going to say uh, that, uh, you know, because I, I know the media business that I'm a big fan of either of those companies uh, at, or was at any given stage, but I'm delighted that you were there at the time and that you were able to make things happen. But it is a great pleasure to have you here this morning because we're going to talk a bit about your political party. But first of all, I left out quite a lot in your CV. I mean, you've done an enormous amount in your life. Why on earth would you go to politics <laughs> and ruin all of it when you've done so well? <laughs> well thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having morning, me. Morning, Roger. Nice to see you. Know, the other morning, uh, my wife woke up and she was scrolling through Twitter or X, yeah. and she found a tweet from someone that says, I was living my best life and then my man went into politics. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah. I, think, I think it's a personal journey, right? You, For me, uh, certainly over the past two elections or so, just looking at where our country's heading, reviewing my own place in the world and what's going on around me, and just building up this view that we all need to, in direct and indirect ways, influence the direction of this country. And um, so last year, with the elections looming this year, I went through the same thing again. And because of my family's rootedness in the in in the politics of this country and social solidarity every election we have a town hall meeting in our family and we discuss the state of the nation in the garden and it's how big is your family you having a town hall <laughs> no no it's about 30 ish 35 ish inter intergenerational mm. grandchildren mm. our generation the the elders and um and we talk about what's happening in one year we conducted a mock poll and it mirrored the national poll. It was very interesting. Oh, oh wow. It, it was exactly the national poll. Um, so it's sort of with that consciousness deciding maybe it's time to step out of the, the corporate world and, um, and see if I can lend a hand in some way and add my voice to what's happening. I think we all do it in WhatsApp groups and sure. around the dinner table. Yeah, everybody thinks they're running for president you know, in their family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we all have strong views, right? And it's and and it's a safe space to share. But, but, but there's yeah. an element of destiny here because of your family's history in politics. There's also, as I understand it, there were a lot of people who you've worked with over the years. You said, listen, you have to get in now. Yeah. It's time yeah. for you to stand up and be counted and make a difference yeah. and all of that stuff. Yeah. So I, I think that's all very honorable. But it's it it sort of started a bit late last year in December. Is that enough time to campaign for these elections? A lot of people name recognition is important. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, I'm very, I'm very mindful of that. Um, I think also, since I started on this journey, a lot has also happened and changed on the political landscape. And I think that as we head into electoral season, there's a very, and certainly in my own mind, the call it the progressive opposition also needs to start thinking about how it coalesces around a single idea for the election. So 
I don't think this is about a, a, any one person. We don't have a presidential electoral system here, right? Mm. You have to get into parliament yeah. and then get nominated, etc. So, um, so I mean, if your party, if yeah. your if your party uh, change starts now, mm. if you did end up with like three seats, you'd be one of the MPs. Yeah, definitely. You'd have to go to parliament. I, I, you've, you've been to parliament. <laughs> you know what parliament's like. You'd want to do that. I I think I I think that the first uh, point is. What is the best way to show up at this election, right? I've been traveling around this country. Uh, you know, I was in Tabecha for a town hall. I was in Cape Town last week. I've been to Sharpville to meet at the, I uh, went to a primary school there that's been without electricity for three years, by the way. And um, talking to people, which is, a, which is a refreshing change for me from the boardroom, just mm. talking to people about their lived experiences every day, right? Mm. And the constant refrain is, uh, as you're saying, you know, this is a new initiative. It came a bit late in the day. Um, and we can talk about, you know, the late in the day <laughs> aspect. Sure. But I do think you'll see a uh, the opposition coalescing more and more. There is obviously the MPC and that whole process that's been happening. And I think that's very admirable. As we You guys are part of that? There. No, we're not part of that. I mean, we... MPC so it's was, admirable, but you don't care, really care about it. No, no, I think it's important. It just <laughs> it happened along the way, and then we we set up, uh, we launched in in December. Would you work with those parties? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Roger, for the first time this year, we're going to have independent candidates, and there's lots of conversation about many political parties. Why the party route and not as an independent? Um. Remember the way the way the independent party candidate system works, right? You you get votes, and then after a certain number of votes, um, it gets divided. Uh, we feel it's important to so change starts now was conceptualized as a movement. When you launched, right? it was a movement. A movement to to get citizens actively engaged in the discussion about the future. And so in my own mind, it was never going to be about one person. We have to bring people into this, into this ambit. So I, I never considered an independent route because there are a lot of like-minded people who were looking for a vehicle and for a point to discuss the future of the country. So it's that, not that dissimilar, though, to what Herman Mashaba did with the People's Dialogue. He, he was trying to pursue the same yeah. course. It started as a movement. Mm. And I mean, I, I had to be reminded of this on Tuesday because we have very short memories. Mm. And it's also not your fault that ultimately in this country, everything mm. becomes around personality politics. Mm. I mean, that's what's happening with MK, with Jacob Zuma mm. as well. Mm. Right. So that's not something that you you're not doing this as some sort of uh, rush for glory. In fact, as I understand it. A bunch of people kind of prevailed upon you in the end to throw your hat into the into yeah, the yeah. Look, I mean, for, is that right? So, 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 in my journey, right, I, I received a very interesting call about two weeks ago from someone I worked with thirteen years ago, who said to me, "I wasn't surprised when I read this." So it's been a combination of talking to people over many years in the community, in, uh, professionally, and just a confluence of my own personal sense of where, where I am in my, in my life, right? I, I stepped away from uh, an institution that I was a part of for many years, and uh, it took me Which the better part of uh, first round. Okay. It took me the better part right. of last year to decide um, to add my voice to this. And uh, again, I mean, you refer to the fact that People invariably, you know, sort of uh, congregate around an individual. Sure. Um, I don't think that my raising my hand to be part of the discussion necessarily follows that I'm campaigning to be the president. We don't have a presidential system. I do think we need fresh ideas in the room, new energy, and new ways of tackling the crisis in South Africa. And I'm part of that, and I want to be part of that the conversation about various people coming to you to say you should put your hand up and you're going through a journey mm. that brought you to the place where you did put your hand up is also something many South Africans 
speak about, and I think we, we've got PTSD from yeah. the Gupta years mm. and the worry that many South Africans have, particularly about all these new parties cropping up, is who Who's paying. those individuals are yeah. Yeah. and how you finance th this particular journey. Mm. Are you willing to share with us who those people are for you and who finances your current journey? So we, we will publish, uh, in terms of the IEC, because we've registered as a party, we will publish who finances change starts now. Okay, I think it's important, and, and it's important for our democracy. Mm -hmm. The universe of donors, if you if you just take a close look, there's a core group of people who fund political parties in this country, and you'll see that for political parties, you cannot do this without finance. The issue when it comes to political party financing is are there strings attached? My personal view is anyone who pays their taxes and is a bona fide business uh, can fund Change Starts Now. The test on influence is going to be in the ideas and the manifesto of Change Starts Now, which is coming out on Monday. And I would just encourage you to look at that and to draw your own conclusions on whether there's any link between funding and the agenda for well, this country. I, yeah, I don't, I don't think that we need to like start. And, and Pumi, you're a big supporter of um, of, of people entering yeah. politics yeah. and making a change yeah. themselves. So I think that that's mm. great. And we'll find out, as yeah. you say, who your yeah. funders are. But there is this idea, and, and a lot of politicians yeah. make hay out of this. Mm. They say, oh, there's this conspiracy of big business and that they've put you forward as their guy. And by big business, they mean, you know, the few that still survive in South mm. Africa under these economic mm. conditions. A couple of corporations that have outsized power and influence, perhaps. Perhaps they don't. We do know that they replaced... Uh, you know, a finance minister once by having a very <laughs> late night meeting with a president yeah. somewhere in Pretoria mm. after he tried to impose, what was the guy's name? Do we oh. even remember? Yes. Uh, Des after Des 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 remember when they tried to force him on us? Anyway, yeah. so people have these ideas yeah. that actually the real levers of power are controlled by huge corporate interests and by very powerful business people. And if anything, the fact that you you know, were, were suddenly proffered to us as a candidate or your party change starts now was, mm -hmm. uh, makes people think along those lines, like who's who's funding this, yeah. where is it coming from? I don't think it's an unfair yeah. question. No, it's not at all. I mean, no, and, and I think, you know, you, so you allude to new ideas being required yeah. in yeah. the room. And I understand that you're going to have on the 19th, I mm -hmm. think it says, you're going to have your manifesto. Yeah. But I would like to hear what for you, um, your top three, new ideas that you believe will change this country. Good. But let me return to the question that you raised because I think it's important. The, it's very important. I think South Africans are jaded by our experience, Gareth, as you've pointed mm. out. Um, and there has to be transparency and we will log our donor funding. That will happen. Um, in terms of South Africa itself, our state is in crisis. Uh, because of the situation with the national income statement being really poor, the budget of South Africa is under stress. We cannot provide basic services to people because of management issues. So where do we start? You may have seen that we commissioned a survey of 9,000 South Africans, a baseline survey across the country, urban and rural. And we spoke to South Africans to say, you know, how are you feeling? What are your priorities, etc.? We cannot move forward if we don't address this issue of jobs. It's the number one issue that we find. Our survey, I think, was the largest in terms of the cohort of people we spoke mm. to. So the topic is jobs, 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 okay? We will be focusing, and everybody says we need to reduce unemployment. We will make concrete proposals on how we go about Get it. it. Roger, yeah. and, and this is, I think, your strongest card. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to bring Canton in, who, yeah. who doesn't believe in change starting now. He believes change starts 15 minutes later. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll let you get away with it this time. Yeah. Um, but to, to go on this jobs thing, because yeah. sometimes you have to just dig a little deeper, right? Yeah. You've been in private business. You've run companies effectively. There's no doubt that you have a, a good, strong record in business. 
unlike maybe like the president of the country who really just you know, benefited from BEE. So in your case, how do you create jobs? Because governments can't make jobs. What things do we need to get rid of? What things do we need to bring in? If you were president tomorrow, how would you create jobs? So a few years ago, I forget how many years ago, I was invited to a workshop or a discussion on job creation hmm. in Pretoria. And my response was, you know, you don't make jobs in a lab somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> right? That which is your point. So when the National Development Plan came out, 2013 or 2012, there was a proposal in that plan which was widely received positively mm -hmm. that if you increase your infrastructure investment to GDP, 30%, 30% of GDP, you can reduce unemployment, I think, to around the 10% mark. Okay? Today, we're sitting at about 14.5%. Wasn't it implemented? Did they it was not, ignore it? It was not implemented. Kenya is at 20%, just to give you a relative sense, right? So we've, we've been talking, while well, the government's been talking about infrastructure for years now, because of gridlock and a whole set of reasons, which speaks to the dysfunction that we're living through, mm -hmm. that hasn't happened. And so it's, it's, a, it's a serious trigger to get this jobs um, rolling. And that is something that I think is urgent in this country. Let's take load shedding, okay? Load shedding the... Uh, the uh, other day I was talking to mainly sort of 18, 19-year-olds. They've only ever known load shedding in their lives, if you think of it. Mm -hmm. They haven't had a life without load shedding. Now, if we fix this load shedding issues through all of the obvious things that have been out there, our GDP growth goes from about 1%, languishing where it is, to 2.5%. By the way, did you see um, Sylvia Lucas in Parliament yesterday <laughs> saying, Ah, this load shedding. What is load? It's not it's not such a big deal, load shedding. Because yeah. she grew up without... Yeah, she said, I grew up with candles. How dare yeah. you complain about load Roger, shedding? I'd, I'd like so, to just climb in on, yeah. on this. On, on can unemployment. I, can I just comment on, on this? Sure. Thing? Sure, sure, sure. Comment on this thing quickly. Mm. So she should go and tell the guy who runs a shop in Soweto whose meat goes rotten. Right. Because of ongoing load shedding. It matters. It's the most you know insensitive thing you could imagine a politician saying, and one of the opposition politicians said something similar, it's like a fat cat, and she actually is quite fat as well. This woman's saying, I don't care about load shedding. That's your problem, because she's never really experienced it since she's been in politics, because, of course, they have uh, different rules, you know, blue light <laughs> brigades, and someone else pays, and we're funding and, sub uh, and subsidizing their lifestyles. But what an incoherent, unkind, insensitive, disconnected thing for a politician to say. Awful. But you see, Gareth, that's what happens. They get us so outraged that we spend time talking about that instead of <laughs> yeah. discussing right, so, the real. Yeah. So, no, so, 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 yeah. so I think we're all on the same page on yeah. the jobs thing, right? right? So just a couple of practicalities. Mm. So firstly, we have another increase in minimum wage coming up. So we have a situation where we have a massive number of unemployed people, but we're raising the cost of entry of people into the job market. So that's something that I'd, I'd like your uh, comment on. Second to your point in terms of uh, uh, investment in infrastructure, yes, again, you're absolutely right. There is that knock-on effect in terms of GDP. We have similar numbers that come up in terms of uh, technology, the rollout of data, for example, to the masses, immediately results in an uptick in terms of, uh, of GDP. At the same time, we need to now fund all of this infrastructure development while we are borrowing money to fund social grants. So how do you actually reconcile all of these things? You know, we have a constant increase in minimum wage, which constantly raises the price of jobs. We have this need to invest in infrastructure, but the money is now being diverted to social grants and increasingly to paying interest on the national debt. Where do we then get the money from? How do we actually reconcile that? That's enough Who question. Takes That's enough from you, Catherine. <laughs> uh, let the man answer. It's 15 minutes later, wants to squeeze everything so, into three. So actually, actually, that question is at the heart of how we take South Africa forward. Because, you know, the, the failure in the provision of basic services to people is a very serious thing. So 
some people would argue that the unlocking of quality of life has less to do with raising wages and more to do with providing public goods. What I mean is when you go to a public hospital, which is where 90% of people get their health care from, you need to get a really good service there, right? The problem we have is that the balance sheet of South Africa Inc. is strained. So we can't afford all of these things. And then you overlay it with a highly competitive, uh, complex global economy yeah. and our economy, which is also complex. And then you say, right, how do we fund these things? Now, let's take ESCOM, for example. The plan for ESCOM has been on the table for five years in terms of how do you deal with transmission, distribution, generation, et cetera. It hasn't been implemented. Transnet. Producers are not getting their goods to the port because of the, the logistics. And when it gets to a port, we can't do anything because the ports are bust, right? Mm. Currently, because of the crisis in, in the Suez Canal, uh, shipping volumes are passing the Cape. We can't capitalize on that. So how do we and how do we fund this, which is really what your question is about. There seems to be a knee-jerk reaction when people talk about utilizing private capital to get these things done. With the Renewable Energy Program, for example, 210 billion rand of, of domestic and international capital was mobilized for these renewable energy projects because they were, they were conceptualized properly. So the way to deal with this is the state needs help. There isn't the money. The human resources have been hollowed out. Where do they happen to sit today? They happen to sit in the private sector. One of the important philosophical points about Change Starts Now is that in the stressed environment, we need social solidarity. What do we mean by that? We mean that the extremely wealthy needs to extend a hand to the extremely poor. People are losing faith in democracy across the world. And you will have seen, if you may, if you, if you, if you saw this um, uh, at Davos uh, earlier this year, there's a global debate uh, from wealthy people to pay more taxes to fund services to stabilize democracy because it's- I call it guilt. Well, but it's not sustainable. Think about yeah, South Africa. Ridiculous. But even if we right? taxed, if we taxed the very wealthy, Roger, at ninety yeah. percent, it's still not going to fill the coffers. Yeah, so, proportionally, it's going to yeah. be tiny. I, I've got to just ask you about the minimum wage mm -hmm. that Canton brought up. What yeah. do we think of that? So, 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 if you look at uh, uh, a proposal on a special economic zone, um, you can choose one around the country. Uh, in Asia and other parts of the world. Input labor costs are managed to make the output more competitive. We need to have a conversation in this country about how do we, how do we restore dignity to people? Because 1994, our parents and grandparents made an X and their dignity was restored. It has slowly been stripped away from people. And so when it comes to the minimum wage and issues like that, we have to have that conversation in the context of global competition, not in the context of just what the agenda is domestically. So I think we need to look at that. <laughs> You're going to like my statement because <laughs> I think Modi in India has done incredibly well, just speaking of special economic yeah. zones and looking yeah. at their local yeah. economy and where opportunity is to, to kind of mm. open up. He's, for me, watching what he's done in the past couple of years has been phenomenal. And I think mm. there are some... Um, conversations that are happening in India that we need to be having in this country. But I just want to come back to the issue for you, mm. Roger, around more than just the policy and, mm. <laughs> you know, and, and what you, because mm. you spoke about the NDP, which is mm. a current government policy that hasn't been implemented well, yeah. according to you. Well, hasn't been implemented. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah, hasn't been implemented. Uh, guys, Absolutely. give them something. Tinswalo is... <laughs> Having a different oh, experience. But anyway, what would, no, seriously, in what we have today, where are the levers that you believe can be low hanging fruits that can be pulled to, to unlock some of South Africa Inc., as you call it, potential today? 
Okay, but that's sitting there yeah, in the space. No. But good question. But again, minimum wage. We haven't like got an answer. We need an answer <laughs> on this. I mean, I'm not I'm not being difficult about this, Roger. But it's important. You think it's a problem? I think it's a it's a problem. Look, the the debate around minimum wage is a debate. People need a decent wage in this country. So the issue is, but no one's following the rules anyway. Because right? someone from Malawi will pay, will be paid uh, less. Someone from Zimbabwe will be will take less. And then our government thinks we're all following the minimum wage rule. Yeah, but that's that. You're raising a different issue, right? Because I mean, the the bottom line is, where do we peg wages to make us competitive? My point is, yeah. is it our job to be pegging wages? And I'm making the case, and you know, please challenge me mm, on this. Mm. I'm making the case, no, it's not government's job to be deciding at what price people should be selling their labor, very simply, because there should be a question of willing buyer, willing seller in this market. There's an example that we've used and we've talked about on this mm. show quite mm. frequently. You have a situation where you have a person, let's say in Tembisa, who is now on a first job, it's a minimum wage job, but she's a single mother. She has a child at home. In order for her to go to work, she needs someone to look after the child. There's a person down the road who's willing to look after the child for a thousand rand a month. In terms of our laws, she's not allowed to hire that person for a thousand rand a month. This, to my mind, is just patently immoral because you're preventing a situation where people are able to achieve that dignity that, that we are talking about. So to my point again, I'm saying that minimum wage is fundamentally immoral because it removes agency from people to decide at what level they are willing to work. No one is forcing people to work for a particular wage. But I'd like you to address no, this. No, no. I, look, I think the issue of minimum wage is a global issue, right? The U.S., uh, there's a, on every election, there's a discussion on minimum wage across Europe, etc. And I'm trying to remember who was it who said you can have a free market economy but you can't have a free market society, okay? In South Africa, we have gross inequality and we have gross poverty. I mean, I'm just stating the obvious, okay? The question in my mind is, and, and this is the issue that you're raising is, and you're saying there should be a free for all basically, and I'm saying to you, I think we need to have this conversation in the context of are those things making us more or less competitive? But to just have a free for all, I'm not so sure that's the right way to go. To to overcorrect on the other side as if we're living in Sweden or Norway is not the right way either. So I don't think it's as simple as that, quite frankly. Okay. So in the economy, because okay. this is this is again yeah. an area where I think you you have a lot of uh, experience and you can bring that to bear in a positive way. You you mentioned how all of these uh, well thought through plans. Part of the NDP, for example, was to activate certain things in the economy mm. that would have made a difference. How, I mean, if it's execution, how would you make sure that that execution is done properly? Because catered deployment has been fingered as the, the big reason that so many things just get lost in translation, that the best policies possibly formulated mm. can't be executed properly because the people who are meant to execute them are incompetent. Mm. Do you think that that's an issue or do you think there's something else going on? So I think cater de deployment has an evil twin, <laughs> okay? So it's definitely a problem, uh, and it's something that should be done away with. But it has an evil twin, and that's the way procurement has been handled, mm. okay? Public procurement. Right. Governments around the world have preferential procurement to shape outcomes. It's not a new thing globally. What has happened here is it has degenerated into a situation where People get huge contracts, say, to provide water infrastructure, whatever, roads. They have no capacity, no skills. Uh, we give them the contracts. We call it inclusion. And then we forget all the people who've been excluded by the failure to provide those services. So I think those two go together in terms of the provision of basic services. So where would we start as Change Starts now? We have to get the best and the brightest in this country to be at the helm of these things. What we've done up to now is there's a, a practice in government that originates in the middle of the past century. You have your policy, then the DG refines it, takes it to the cabinet, 
the cabinet opines on it and agrees on it, and then we all think the job is done. And that is why we have a policy jamboree ongoing and no implementation jamboree. So what we would do differently is to focus on project management and delivery or enablement, which is a huge um, focus in any private business. How do you get things done? Mm. And how you get things done is you get it done by having the right people who know what they're doing to get things done. I think the public service, uh, there are basically thousands of people there who join the public service because they want to do good. And very soon they are strangled by an inefficient top layer uh, that's been deployed there, and then they're frustrated. I'm not. I'm generalizing, but generally, that's the that's the way I see it. So, I think it's very important that we deal with the scalar deployment issue urgently, and that we also deal with the way we manage procurement in this, especially for our big public projects. So, in terms of, I'm going to ask my question again mm. because it's a long time yeah. since I've asked it. <laughs> Uh, today, with what, <laughs> where we sit, the quick wins and the easy levers for you are? So the quick wins and the e easy levers is, firstly, we have to deal with the balance sheet. I would bring in, I would mobilize private sector capital. What are the two big elephants in the room? Or what, what is the elephant in the room in South Africa today? What's draining our national resources today. SOEs, because of the way they've managed, there's hundreds of billions of debt there. Mm -hmm. um, we have the specter of a default or seeking more debt. So how do we solve that? Okay, I think that the quick win is to bring relief to that balance sheet so that the government can look after its people. And the way to do that is to mobilize private sector capital for ESCOM and for Transnet. This isn't a new idea. It just has to be done. So let's take Transnet, for example. Okay, We all know logistics and ports, there's a blockage there. People can't get the product to, to market. And as a result, they're taking strain. So I would start there. We have to fix that immediately. And, and what is the knock-on effect of that? Jobs. But Cyril, one of the very first things Cyril did when he came into, into government was he held a presidential summit investment, exactly doing exactly what you're saying, unlocking private sector capital for infrastructure but it hasn't spending happened. in South Africa. And he's not had one, yeah. he's had four since yeah. he's been. So he's done that and we have not seen the dividend. How is what you are suggesting different from what Cyril yeah, has done? I'll tell you why, why it's different. I'll tell you why it's different. We do not have the encumbrance of a dysfunctional party machine where you have to go and negotiate your through, way through a myriad of issues. And so I think the big difference is the ideas on how to get out of here have been around. They just need to be done. And for a whole range of reasons, they are stuck in the system. And they're stuck in the system because we have a highly dysfunctional government where things don't get done. So it's not new ideas, as you said at the beginning. It's just doing what's on the on the agenda, just making it happen. So well, it's not new ideas. No, no, no. I'll tell you where, where we will bring some new thinking. We, we will actually quantify what we think the value uplift is. It's not a generic let's invest in infrastructure. Okay, We've actually looked at where do we actually intervene. Some of this is in our manifesto coming out next week. So I'm... I'm Sure. I want to save it for the. I want to save it for the big sure. reveal, but um, can I give you another example? Okay, public hospitals. People go to hospitals for healthcare. Ninety percent do. Why do they have the experience that they have? It's not rocket science. I mean, you you asked me, why did I step away from what I was doing? I think in part, it was just a frustration with looking around for years, and I don't want to make it sound like an easy fix, but it's not rocket science. No. It doesn't have to be this way. We are just stuck in the system. So what are the, what are the key things? I said jobs. I think that will be an infrastructure-led thing. ESCOM. Why hasn't ESCOM gotten its act together over the 18 years or so 
in the lifetime of a person going to university now, when we know what the issues are, right? Mm -hmm. There have been numerous, numerous discussions on how to get ISCOM out of its out of its situation. There's a slew of measures, about six of them, getting more rooftop solar. The president mentioned the transmission grid on Thursday. That's been around forever. Why doesn't it happen? Getting a stable um, energy supply. If we do all of those things, all of those things, it will take three to four years to solve mm -hmm. load shedding. Okay? I don't think it's wise to tell South Africans we are almost out of load shedding, we threw the worst, etc. Those things have to happen. And what is different is we will get it done because it is just stuck. Okay, so we agree. It's not necessarily new ideas. It's just project managing what's in the system. You know, Roger, we, we will have a Roger, new, we will do, have a new before idea. You, before yeah? you go, I do yeah. want to ask this question, yeah. Roger, because yeah. you have mentioned healthcare mm. two or three times right. in this conversation. Yeah. And as we know, yeah. Cyril is looking for a pen to sign yeah. NHI yeah. into. What's your view on NHI? So, so on new ideas, we will have <laughs> new ideas in our manifesto, and you'll see that. So NHI, uh, it mustn't be positioned as being pro or against universal health coverage. A society has to look after its people. This proposal, which is masquerading as healthcare reform, wants to aggregate healthcare funding, about 600 billion rand, into an SOE type structure. It's not gonna work. So what we would do, is we would focus firstly on fixing our public health care system, which was once an amazing network of teaching, learning, training, and care. It's been decimated for, whole, for reasons we all understand. So we think rather than tinkering and introducing a new moving part into the state, let's fix our public health care facilities. That would be our, our approach to that. How do you fix it without the ability to fire people who don't perform? And a very specific example I'll give you is the case of Barra. So I had a family member who was deployed mm -hmm. to try and fix Barra for a period, and he was acting chief executive officer out there. The very simple thing of him trying to discipline nurses who were sitting and sipping on their tea while you had patients who were pushing on their buzzers, desperately calling for help, and the nurses were completely ignoring them. At the point at which he tries to actually institute disciplinary action against them, he gets up against Nehau, the, the union. Um, he ends up, as usual, being the person that's last to leave at night, goes down to his car, finds his tires have been slashed. It's a gangster world out there mm. because of the unionized environment where you cannot discipline people for not doing their jobs. And this is something that cuts across the public sector. This comes back now to the question of our labor laws, where the ability of people to be able to fire non-performers is severely restricted in terms of our labor laws. So against that backdrop, injecting money into the scenario is not going to help if you can't actually fire people for non-performance. So again, you know, how do we go to address that? But let's park that question for now because I, that's too much minutiae for us. No, to no, but I want to answer it. Okay. Let him, let him, let him answer it. I want, sure, to, sure. Answer, I want right. to answer it because mm. I, I think we, we cannot accept some of these things as, as normal. Sure. Right? And it's all mired in the political management of this country. And so, again, I don't want to trivialize the fix. Okay? But the idea that so, – so, by the way, I also <laughs> know a – young, newly minted, very enthusiastic doctor who's working at that hospital and getting these stories about the experience of the, the dysfunction there, right? So I think these public institutions, whether it's a hospital or anything else, that management is breaking down because of a general breakdown in the political management of this country where, th where anything goes. And then people feel that there's no recourse. You know, so you can even have a situation where a porter can tell a doctor, give me 10 rand or 20 rand, otherwise this patient will stay right where, here where they are. So I think it's all tied into a, a larger narrative of where we are in the political management of this country. And that's why we need to change it. 
And I think if the messaging from the center is we don't condone this stuff, we don't we don't uh, just let it slide, it starts to shift the culture in the workplace so that the public service becomes the public service. So, I mean, they, and the ample examples of this, you can choose a home affairs office, you can choose anything, but I think, I think it's all in the management of the country. So Roger, it sounds to me right now, um, and, uh, uh, you know, obviously you're going to have strong views on this, yeah. but right now there's not much that differentiates what you are saying from what the DA is saying. Essentially, they're saying we keep the, the big state, we keep a lot of the framework in terms of the legislation that we currently just have. Make it more we, just, we just do it in a more competent level. So what's the differentiator then between what you're trying to do and what the DA is trying to do? What, what, what sets you apart? No, so, so let's take another example, okay? There are any number of parties out there who have their own ideas. Okay, let's take the issue of crime. Okay, and my, my departure point is, is very simple. I think when we have political discussions in this country, we tend to start with, well, is it pro-capitalist or is it socialist? We give it labels, okay? My, my starting point is what is the best solution, okay, for this country? And then you can add a label if you want to. So if, you, if you're looking for a political texture to what we're talking about, it's more of a social democratic texture than anything else. So on the issue of crime, globally, crime is local, okay? Mm -hmm. Crime is a local thing. It doesn't help if you're in your township or your suburb and you don't know who the local station commander is and if you go there, there's a recourse to Pretoria, okay? So I actually support a conversation around how do we localize crime fighting and crime prevention. It is, it is not necessarily linked to wanting to unravel a unitary state or anything, but it's how do you best deal with that situation, okay? I think coming back to your DA question, our manifesto will answer that, okay? I think we we are developing a view of South Africa based on the lenses through which we see it, not through which any other party sees it, where there are overlaps. I mean, for example, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, uh, the current president talks about infrastructure all the time. Well, we talk about infrastructure all the time. So maybe we're similar to the current government. So there will be similar views on different areas the, the difference, I think, is that we are focusing on the fix and we want to differentiate ourselves on the fix that we're going to bring to this thing because we know where the right people are. We think we can mobilize them. We believe we can mobilize them. And where there are overlaps in terms of thinking, then so be it. You're speaking Canton's so, language. He just wrote a book called <laughs> How to Fix South Africa. Well, this <laughs> is the question language. I'm asking. Yeah. Um, all the various people that are coming to to speak with us. Mm -hmm. What are your projections in terms of the election and how you are mobilizing? What are the numbers that you are projecting you can get? Yeah. Yeah. So so we it's early in the day for us. We've just started. Uh, we'll start doing our own polling. Um, I do think as the elections loom there is a conversation to be had amongst opposition parties. I mean, currently the MPC says they will run the election on their own and then they'll meet afterwards, okay? The political landscape has changed in this last two months or so in South Africa. And so I think there needs to be a conversation on how we enter the election, pre-election and post-election. So at this stage, I don't have a number for you. Suffice to say, we are getting out there. We are spreading our message. Our own research before the MK party <laughs> uh, was formed uh, was that the ANC is at about the 40% level. Um, and we, you can find the research. We, it was published in uh, another publication last Monday. Uh, we've been doing, in addition to our 9,000-person um, research, we've also been tracking the polling as well. 
and we have a good idea of where we need to be in terms of maximizing um, our results. So uh, it's early days for us, but we'll we we developing a view on that. And what's your your message now that we are all talking about Denzualo has been <laughs> what are what are you saying to Denzualo to get her to vote for you? You know, I'm saying to Tinsualo, there's a lot of um, disappointment and disillusionment on the ground. We need to weigh the consequences of how, what we do on election day. For many people who voted a certain way, there's been an outcome. To carry on this way, uh, and you asked me earlier, why, why did I step forward to add my voice to this? I think if we don't have a major shift in this election, we're going to have a very different conversation in 2029 if we have more of the same. So to Tinsualo, I say, <clears throat> exercise your vote. Uh, if Tinsualo is a graduate who can't find a job, and I've met many Tinsualos of that sort of uh, profile, and I've said to them, I've seen the way learnerships, I'm going to use one example. I've seen the way learnerships work in, in, in the corporate world. You bring in 100 people, ideally, they should be absorbed into permanent roles. Businesses aren't growing, so maybe 40 get a permanent job. So Tinsualo and that generation have to exercise their vote in a way that clears the runway for them. And so I'd say to them, choose change. In fact, we picture an on-ramp to a highway. We're saying choose the change lane because the change lane involves jobs. We have ideas on how to deal with crime and security, specific ideas. A lot of people say crime is a problem. We have specific ideas on how to deal with that. And young people have to be politically engaged and not look up to older people uh, only. If you look at our generation in the 80s, I mean, uh, the, the chairperson that changed us now is Murphy Marobi. He was 25 or 26 when the UDF was set up, okay? Um, I became a DG at 29. I think people must take their future into their hands and help to drive where we're going. So I would say to Tinsualo and others, the future's in your hands. Don't stay away from the polls. Yeah, go and, and vote. Go and vote and vote for change. It's an interesting thing that you bring up about Murphy Murabe and mm. yourself and, and uh, where, others, you, yeah. where you were mm. at the time when change was mm. desperately needed in this country. Why have you taken the route of not becoming a mentor to today's Murphy Murabe, to Ed Dinswalo and say, here's an opportunity, we're going to back you, we're going to support you, but this is the face of our party. Why is it old, guys? So, so we've positioned Change Starts now as an intergenerational movement. So we have lots of young people in our, uh, in our party. Um, and we've all minted young people over the years. I think your question is specifically in this political context. Uh, it is something that has to happen, and we are doing it. And when it comes to young people, we should intensify our efforts and do more. So we are working in partnership with young people. So uh, uh, my chief of staff, uh, my pony, Monotani from Orange Farm, she's 33 years old. I work with her every day and uh, she's amazing. And we can have that um, back and forth around the future. So it's an intergenerational thing. It's not just the old guys. Okay. I want to address the question of the 80% and the 80% are the people who right now have no stake whatsoever in our country. You know, so we've got a middle class that we struggle along, but we do reasonably well, all things considered. And that's the 20% that keeps the economy ticking over. But the 80% are the masses who continue to vote for the ANC simply because... Or don't vote. Or, or don't vote or don't at vote. all, yeah. as the case may be. The very good example that was raised yesterday, guys, I don't know if you followed the story that in KZN, there was a $2 billion mining um, operation that had to be put on ice because the local community refused to allow it to proceed because of the fact that there were um, 
the burial grounds and all mm. of that type of thing that would be disturbed. And from their perspective, they, they have no incentive whatsoever to disrupt their way of life in the greater national good. We know right now, and you know, to your mm. point of capitalism versus socialism versus social mm. democrats and so forth, trickle down doesn't actually work anywhere in the world. How do we actually translate everything that happens? Because right now we speak around the 20% of the economy. How do we translate the benefits of what happens there to a meaningful improvement in the lives of the 80% that then gives mm. them a stake in actually recognizing why it's important for me to give up the place where my ancestors are buried in order for there to be a mining project that's now going to benefit the country as a whole? There isn't this connect. Mm. How do you tap into that mindset? Because I can't see us growing as a country unless we're able to bridge that gap. But I think that's linked to what I said earlier about a free market economy and a free market society. People cannot see in 2024 that 80% are struggling to see the benefits of growth, of democracy, uh, and essentially people are on the outside looking in. And I think it's that disillusionment and isolation that brings people to a point where they say, okay, here's a 2 billion rand project. What's it, how's it going to fix my clinic down the road? And so, and again, I don't make this sound like it's easy, but we're not joining the dots, okay? And if you, if you run a big successful business and you feel that you're an island and that you're just going to focus on the lowest wages possible, the maximum output, and not link the dots between the community down the road. I've had to, as a CEO, I've had to make choices about a business in a tough economy where we have to retrench people. Okay. Now, and in one in one instance, I actually asked my colleagues, I said, okay, now the I think it was 100, 150 people in lower paid jobs living down the road. Now, if we retrench those people, what happens socially around this, this factory, okay? If we look at two or three highly paid people, which probably equal <laughs> a big number of, of people, how do you balance that? And I think it's a mistake to say, this is the private sector, this is the public sector. And that's why in South Africa today, if we do not have social solidarity, if we don't start thinking that we're all in this together, right? So. So in that mining, that project you're talking about, usually there needs to be a social plan in, for the surrounding community, okay? When a community is that alienated from a situation where clearly they'll get jobs, they'll benefit, et cetera, it just speaks to the, the isolation that people feel from all the stuff that's happening around us, and we have to fix that. And we have not talked. This is another thing that, that worries me. When last have we talked about who we are as South Africans? We've, we've, our, our dinner tables and our WhatsApp groups have been filled with tenders, state capture, corruption, legitimately so. But we don't talk about who are we as South Africans? What do we stand for? How do we show up for each other? And, and chuckling because that's the very first chapter Raj, in my book. I think Raja's in the same WhatsApp group as, <laughs> as me because yeah. this is a conversation no, that was happening in a WhatsApp group. No, but you know what I think? Yeah. And yeah. Hotla, yeah. Hotla, the former yeah. state, yeah. Um, state yeah. statistician general, general, yeah. general yeah. your <clears throat> English, yeah. has, has a very uh, fascinating view about yeah. the identity of South Africa and precisely mm. that, how because we, we haven't concretize this or we have stopped talking about it, it has led to a lot of the veering away right. of what social cohesion can be and what a um, shared mandate for a government looks like right. for everybody. Yeah. And when we talk about social cohesion, I have found, we tend to talk to each other. <laughs> We're basically socially coherent. We need to talk to people that we have differences with yeah. so we can find each other. But we've all sort of, it, it looks like the, as, as in the rest of the world for a whole, and this is a subject of a whole another show of yours, this uh, fleeing into 
silos. Into silos. And, yeah. you know, it's, it just seems to be on the rise. And it gets worse in a situation like ours where there's inequality and poverty and people feel on the outside. And if we don't fix this ASAP, we're going to have a so different how, conversation. How, how do you think we are? You asked who are we and what do you think of when you think of the best of South Africa? Because I'm, I'm interested in that. I like that line of questioning. I like that line of thought. What, what could we be if this country was run effectively? Let's say technocratically. Let's say we just made decisions based on the data that got us to a better place economically and socially and politically. Put all of that aside. What do we look like in your best outcome? I mean, if, if you and your party mm, ended up mm, in charge, what mm, would you really like mm. to see five years from now? I think, um, and this is a conversation that I was part of years ago. South Africa is a very diverse country. And, you know, this whole, so we, at various times we talk about identity and who are we, et cetera. It's in our motto, right? unity and yeah, diversity. in diversity. Which doesn't really yeah. mean anything. But I think we should, first of all, embrace our diversity. People speak different languages, eat different food. It's, it's a tapestry. It's beautiful. I think we should focus on what is our South African consciousness. When we say I'm a South African, what do we actually mean? What do we, how do, what do we think of each other as South Africans? What is our national aspiration as South Africans? Whilst allowing us to have that diversity of culture and language and food and all of those things. And so when I think about five years hence, I mean, isn't it amazing whenever a South African achieves something, we tap into that consciousness fleetingly. Mm. Then we all sort of stand up and we... We're good with it. And so we're so desperate for a good story. Right? So, so I think we need more of that conversation. We're all South African. We, we diverse. But as South Africans, this is what we stand okay, for. Okay, but not to be unkind. Yeah. You brought up diversity. So yeah. by, by asking what South Africa is, who we are, you've just told me we're all different. No, 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 no. Diversity doesn't speak to different in a negative uh, connotation. Okay. It's, it's true. I mean, we have a myriad of official languages, okay? There's some dynamics around the country. We should be able to enjoy those traditions that we come from without feeling that we are less South African than the other. So all I'm saying is we need to work towards a South African consciousness. How do you do that with BEE in place? Do you get rid of BEE, for example, as one of the things that you would do? Because yeah, you faced that from, you know, being part of our 94 government yeah. in effect, and then on the private sector side too. That's a good question. What do you do with that? I think our problem when it comes to that is a problem of political economy, okay? Because you can get rid of BEE, and then you have a different structural problem with the economy, and you still have people left out. So I think... It's it's more complex than just getting rid of BE. But you just use poverty as a marker. Yeah. So you empower everyone who is below a certain poverty threshold. And the overwhelming majority of those are the 80% of the population who happen to be overwhelmingly black. So it's possible for you to do to fix the problem without using a racial criteria. So why keep it in place? I think that the Okay, let's, let's look at the issues around the involvement of black people in the economy of this country, okay? We've made immense progress. Uh, the question, I think where we're heading to is a, is a BE 2.0, because this, this round of BE clearly has had negative consequences in large measure, because if you look at who has come in, it has tended to focus on a few people. But uh, Roger, you know, yeah. just you know, to focus on yeah. the, the heart of my question, mm. it's still fundamentally racism because it's saying that we applying a racial criteria. Eventually, we're going to get to the point of a pencil test because we no longer have a population registration act that says what we are in terms of our race. Right now, we're required to self-identify to the point around how do we build a cohesive social consciousness at a national level 
how can we do that when we well, have a society? Uh, yeah, well, well, what, is, what does BE 2.0 look like? How would it be? So, so how do you, how do you, 30 years into democracy with, um, and I don't want to get into a conundrum of, of blaming everything on a party. I think we beyond that. Um, countries around the world find measures to include people in the economy and in the corporate world. Okay. So I think it's too early to wholesale say, let's scrap this or that, because either way, it's going to impact on social cohesion. The question is, how do you carry on this journey um, in a way that doesn't breed that kind of division? What, what has happened is a few oligarchs have emerged. Okay, You know, in 2001, uh, I ran Cajiso Media, hmm. and we won <laughs> that year the top empowerment performer on the JSE Award. Okay, And I spoke to my chairman, Eric Malobi, at the time, and I asked him, uh, okay, I'm going to accept this speech. What should I say in the speech? What would you like me to include? And he said to me, you can say whatever you want to, just remember one thing. The BEE project has to be linked to poverty alleviation. It can't just be about building a balance sheet for a private individual. So when I talk about BEE 2.0, that's what I'm talking about. How do we how do we look at the exclusion of people um, in this context and how do we deal with that? But to carry on the way we are. And this preferential book procurement issue that I mentioned earlier, um, my personal view is it's, it's the original sin in the dysfunction around service delivery, okay? Now, some people will argue that's BEE, okay? But it's not BEE if it's not providing services to people. So I think that's the the lens through which I would look at this. Gums, you got the last one. And I'm I'm so conflicted because I want to ask a question which I'm going to ask it anyway. Go on. And we're going to have the extra <laughs> time. No, I'm yeah, sorry, guys. I'm sorry, guys. You're going to have to we listen got Roger to Roger here. We're going to keep thing. him here for <laughs> <laughs> to listen to yeah. an extra bit yeah. on mm -hmm. the podcast. Yeah. Where you come from and your history is intimately linked to the ANC and how it has been part of the South African fabric post-94. And a lot of what you speak about is around project managing ideas that have been on the table and not properly or fully implemented. And I'm wondering why when you were inside this organization, you were not part of propagating all of that. Why? Why do you need? Why did you need to be outside the organization to push these things? What is it that you couldn't do on the inside that you think you can do on the outside? So, so firstly, um, I left the government almost a quarter century ago, just to put it in perspective. So I haven't been close to those levers. Secondly, would you want to tell us why you left? Why, I Why you went into private enterprise rather than being government? I think that's a yeah. I, I was a DG for uh, that first term. I think we all have our own personal ambitions sure. and aspirations. And and uh, Eric Malobi approached me. I held him in high regard. Remember, Kahisa was set up during apartheid as a development agency, and then it segued into uh, a, an investment trust to carry on uh, making money to fund. Development, so there was a, a link between where I came from and a mission, and that's why I went into Kahiso at the time. Okay. So, the things that I'm talking about now, I've been talking about them uh, for many years, and in fact, you can go and read all of my chairman statements of the last five years. You'll see this the same themes. So, yeah, I am sort of 24 years or so later uh, outside of corporate institutions. And I can speak more freely about these topics, but I have been talking about them. It's not a new thing for me. I also haven't been part of party structures for a long time. So it's not like I've been inside keeping quiet. Right. So I haven't been part of, of that for a very long time. So it's the Macron situation for me. <laughs> you know, my, my, and my question stands. Mm. Why, why 
Did you disagree? It was 25 years ago. And I, I, I do think that's ago. a bit unfair to, no, but uh, it's, uh, to be pushing you know, that. Because so. we're, we're talking about, no, no mm. it's not actually. Because yeah. when you talk about needing change and wanting South Africans to be mobilized into doing something, doing something looks different in lots of different guises. Mm. And I'm asking about why you disengaged when you did. And why you feel now is the right time to re-engage? So, so first of all, I have always frowned upon uh, being in business and being in politics at the same time. You know, and in fact, that was a very profound influence again of my mentor Eric Malobi, who said you must choose. Like that, you you conflate wealth and political power, and then you end up in a mess. Mm -hmm. So, it was a very conscious decision. For me, as part of that young generation growing up in Kahiso, to not be seen on political platforms and to work for the private sector in that way. Okay. We we thought the way to contribute was if we were asked at the time to help on a board. I, I served as chairman of CSR and Atomic Energy Corporation when I was at Kahiso. Okay. Mm. But that was a those were um, science councils which is the skill I brought to that particular thing. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't in the room as such, okay? In terms of where I find myself now, you know, they say when the facts change, you must change your mind. It's become very clear that the journey that we are on is not a good one, okay? And also the path that the, this party has taken is not a good one. And that has informed my decision. Uh, not to sit idly by, but to speak up. Well, it's probably a good place to end it. Um, and I really, uh, I, I love hearing from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I'm not calling you a horse, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I do want to talk to you one day about the CSIR, and I want to talk yeah. about uh, the, the SALT yes. uh, telescope that you were also mm. involved in and the Atomic Energy Corporation, which is a disaster as well at the moment. We've never really bothered to pay attention to that, but it's mm. worthy of some attention because when you're dealing with <laughs> bombarding nuclei of atoms, it tends to be kind of uh, dangerous to mess with it. And we, we seem to have lost our way on that front as well. So I want to talk about all those things if you'll come in again some other time. But for the moment, good luck for the election. I say Thank this to everyone much. who's been in here. Change starts now. You can find them on the internet. You can find them on social media and everywhere else. Thank you, Canton. Thank you, Pumi. Most especially, thank you, Roger Jardine. And to everybody who's sent in questions, comments, keep them coming. We will have uh, more of the political leaders that you want to hear from in the next couple of weeks and heading up to the election. This is The Burning Platform. We will see you tomorrow at 6 